friends welcome welcome folks to this year's uh, rice hassan distinguished lecture i know that um absolutely none of you are here to hear from me and so that's why i'm going to turn things over to my friend and boss dean marcus cole uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Garnett. Uh, I'm certainly your friend, um, but because you have tenure, I don't see how I could be your boss. Uh, bosses normally are able to fire someone, but uh, I can't fire him. Um, uh, welcome to this year's uh, Rice Hassan Lecture. Uh, this is perhaps the most important public lecture that we have here at uh, Notre Dame Law School. Uh, and to demonstrate the efficiency of Notre Dame Law School, this is the conception of one person, Professor Rick Garnett, a lecture with two names, Rice Hassan, but it honors three people. And I wanna talk about those three people before I turn it back over to Professor Garnett to make the introduction. The three people that this lecture honors are Professor Charlie Rice, the late Professor Charlie Rice, uh, his daughter, Mary Rice Hassan, and her husband, Seamus Hassan. And they are all important uh, to both Notre Dame Law School, but also to uh, American law, um, uh, each making uh, significant contributions. Um, Charlie Rice was a longtime professor here at this uh, law school. Uh, started teaching here in 1969 after a career in the Ma Marine Corps, and actually, um, uh, retired as a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps and served in the Marine Corps Reserves. He had 11 children, including uh, Mary Rice, uh, and um, taught here from 1969 to 2000 when he uh, took on uh, emeritus status. I met Charlie Rice in uh, 1997 uh, when he and Jerry Bradley uh, tried to recruit me here uh, to uh, Notre Dame uh, Law School. Um, and at the time, I remember it was one of the most important conversations I've ever had in my career uh, because I was deeply concerned about what it meant to be a Catholic in the legal academy and whether um, that was something that I should hide or something that I should work into my scholarship. And Charlie Rice was uh, emphatic that, um, that my Catholicism should inform every single thing I do. And I took that advice and uh, went back to him time and time again when I ran into trouble. Uh, but he was consistent and right about that uh, advice, that um, my work would mean nothing to me if it weren't for my faith. And so I'm grateful to him. He's also a visionary, a very insightful man. Um, decades ago, he wrote this book on the right to life uh, and the abortion debate. And he entitled this book, Decades ago, he entitled this book, The Winning Side, because he knew that at some point, whether it would be in his lifetime or not, the arguments in favor of human dignity and life were going to win. And I'm so sorry he didn't live to see the day that uh, Roe versus Wade was overturned, but largely on the arguments that he crafted and advanced throughout his career. Second person uh, I, uh, I want to mention uh, who's honored by this, uh, this um, lecture series uh, is Mary Rice Hassan, uh, who was Charlie Rice's daughter, but was also instrumental in advancing the cause of human dignity uh, and, uh, and life. Uh, and currently uh, sits as chair of the board of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, um, which was uh, founded by her husband, Seamus Hassan. Um, Seamus Hassan, you may have heard me mention before because uh, he was a student here, graduated from Notre Dame Law School in 1985, um, but a book that he wrote uh, changed my life. Uh, that, that book uh, was entitled The Right to be wrong. And it makes it, uh, the most compelling case you will ever read for why religious liberty is the most fundamental freedom that we have, that all other freedoms are based upon it. 
And our religious liberty initiative here is simply taking the ideas of Seamus Hassan and putting them into play here at Notre Dame Law School uh, with our scholars, with our uh, clinic, and with our students uh, to make a difference in the world for religious freedom. Uh, and so I'm honored that I get to say this every year about uh, these three people who mean so much to me, mean so much to Notre Dame Law School. And so uh, with that, I want to turn it back over to Professor Rick Garnett to introduce this year's um, Rice Hassan Lecturer. I'll be really quick. Uh, as I said, uh, it is just a joy to welcome back to Notre Dame Law School because he was on our faculty before he got this confused idea to go hang out in San Diego. Uh, but to welcome back Professor Stephen Smith. Uh, he's the Warren Distinguished Professor uh, at the University of San Diego uh, Law School, and he's taught at many institutions. He's written, uh, I'm going to use a technical term, a billion law review articles, uh, and they're all great. And don't hold this against him, but there are a few people who've had more of an impact on how I think about law um, than Stephen Smith. But again, that's not his fault. Um, listen to some of his books. For Ordained Failure, Getting Over Equality, Law's Quandary, The Disenchantment of Secular Discourse, Pagans and Christians, The Pride of Reason, The Disintegrating Conscience. No, those aren't heavy metal bands. <laughs> <laughs> Those are Steve's books. <laughs> um, so I think you've got a flavor of kind of the Steve Smith vibe just from hearing those titles. Um, but it is really a pleasure to have him here. I'm really grateful uh, to the uh, benefactors for the Rice Hassan Lecture, um, my good friends Thomas and Mara Lehrman, uh, who are going to be here this weekend. And it's also a special pleasure to have last year's Rice Hassan Lecturer, uh, President John Garby, who has the cool title, or he had it when he was at uh, Catholic University, he had the title, title Rector Magnificus, which <laughs> just if you're looking to give me a title, that's the one I want. <laughs> so with that, please join me in welcoming Stephen Smith. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Rick, Professor Garnett. And, um, Thanks to everybody for, for being here, you know, on a Friday afternoon. It really is a, a pleasure for me to be here. I we came in last night and then we were walking around campus a little this morning. It brought back some a lot of memories, actually. And um, one of them was how just I think a little over a quarter of a century ago, uh, John Garvey, who was not yet Rector Magnificus, but uh, uh, invited me out on a day like this. I think it was maybe a little earlier. It was a sunny, I think maybe October afternoon. And we went canoeing up the um, St. Joseph River, as I recall, um, and uh, had a really good time. He didn't mention that that was probably like the last day of sunshine that would be seen here in six months and so forth. But, uh, but uh, it was a special experience, and it led to um, my family and I. We, we came here and, um, and uh, spent a few years here. Uh, John very quickly left to be the dean at Boston College and then the president of Catholic University, and things didn't work out quite well, so I was only here the, quite the way that I had expected, and I was here for a few years and, and then moved to San Diego, as Professor Garnett said. Uh, but I really cherish the friendships that we made here. Uh, I always regard the University of Notre Dame with great affection. I always root for Notre Dame in every football game unless they happen to be playing Brigham Young University, but, uh, but otherwise, you know, uh, a passionate fan. And, um, and so it's a pleasure to be back here. And it's really an honor also to be asked to teach, to, to give this lecture. Uh, when I heard that the previous lectures had been John Garvey and Marianne Glendon, I thought, oh, well, uh, you know, that, those will be a hard act to follow and so forth. But, uh, but a lecture named after a couple of people that I, uh, that are legends, I think. I haven't had the opportunity of meeting Seamus Hassan, but I, of course, know of his writing, Dean Cole mentioned, and, of course, his wonderful work with the Beckett Fund and so forth. I did have the pleasure of knowing Charlie Rice. Uh, he taught here during the years that I was here, and uh, he taught about the same courses that I taught, actually, torts and constitutional law. So I tried to make his acquaintance early on so that he could tell me a little bit about, you know, how those things worked and so forth. And he was polite and, um, and uh, helpful. 
but he seemed just a little bit, I don't know, suspicious or something or other, you know, and th there might have been reasons for that. Um, <laughs> but then I remember one day he came into my office with a big smile on his face and he says, I read one of your articles and I think you might be okay or something like that. <laughs> and, and, uh, so, uh, uh, so, um, I'm hoping that he'll think that the lecture that I give today, that he'd approve of that, you know, that that, that would be okay in, in uh, Charlie's uh, evaluation. Um, so I, I do apologize as I've gotten a little older, various things have deteriorated. And one is that uh, I, I can't focus very well on things that are several feet below me. So I'm gonna hold my paper up today as I, as I give the lecture. Um, I wanna start with by re remembering something that happened um, about a year ago. So late last year, um, Americans witnessed an embarrassing spectacle in which the presidents of three of the country's most prestigious universities were asked in a congressional hearing whether advocacy of genocide would violate their institution's codes of speech and conduct. And in response, they gave answers that sounded tepid and equivocal. Now, I would say at the beginning that I had more sympathy for these hapless presidents than many people did. Uh, I think that even the application of fundamental principles can depend on context, as the president said. Um, I'm sorry to say that I myself am a sort of a vacillating kind of fellow, as you may perceive during the course of this talk. And I would not want to have to answer the questions that were posed to the presidents in that fraught setting. Uh, nonetheless, the fact is that against the backdrop of angry campus activism, the president's bland statements came across as a vivid illustration of Yates's well-known line about the best lacking all conviction while the worst are full of passion and intensity. Yates's poem is about a society that's falling apart and that in its dissolution is threatened by some obscure but ominous catastrophe. And this picture seems to many of us to capture the mood of our present situation. Many of us today, pundits, scholars, ordinary citizens, struggle to understand just what sort of situation we're in and how we came to be in this situation. Why is it that the center can no longer hold, as Yates put it? Why do the best among us, or at least respectable people in positions of political and academic leadership, and sometimes even religious leadership, so often seem to lack all conviction? What is the monstrous beast that is slouching toward Jerusalem or toward Washington and London and Paris? These are perplexing questions, and I have no competent or overall answers. But in this lecture, I wanna offer one perspective, a tentative one that's related to the issue of religious freedom, which is what this lecture is supposed to be about. And it's also inspired by the spectacle of the waffling university presidents. So let me go back a few decades to 1960. With the benefit of hindsight, it seems to have been a time of transition. The piety on the Potomac, so-called, of the Eisenhower years was coming to an end, but America's heavy involvement in Vietnam and the sexual revolution and the so-called hippie movement and so forth were still a few years in the future. Uh, less conspicuously, uh, I was baptized at the age of eight. Um, in that same year, Father John Courtney Murray published a book of essays under the title of We Hold These Truths about what he called the American Proposition or the American Project in Republican Government. Let me quickly mention three features of Murray's interpretation. First, as his title suggested, Murray argued that America was founded on a set of important truths, the so-called truths of the Declaration of Independence, self-evident truths of the Declaration of Independence. But second, Murray didn't view these as settled, self-interpreting, once and for all truths that merely needed to be recited and enforced. Acknowledging the country's profoundly pluralistic character, um, he envisioned an ongoing debate about these truths, about their truthfulness, their meaning, their implications. We hold certain truths, Murray said, therefore we can argue about them. Third, the primary founding truth was the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God, not just over individuals or churches, but over nations. The divine sovereignty was something to be acknowledged, not just privately, but publicly. Here's Murray. The first truth to which the American proposition makes appeal is stated in that landmark of American political theory, the Declaration of Independence. It is a truth that lies beyond politics. It imparts to politics a fundamental human meaning. I mean the sovereignty of God over nations as well as over individual men. The first article of the American political faith is that the political community as a form of free and ordered human life looks to the sovereignty of God as the first principle of its organization. Murray's interpretation of America reflected a more general supporting philosophy. It reflected a confidence that there is such a thing as truth, including moral and political truth, that humans have some capacity to discern such truth and to reason about it. 
that one of those truths, the primary truth actually, is the reality of a God who takes an interest in the affairs of human beings, including their political affairs. That even under conditions of pluralism, a community should be based on truth or on the community's best efforts to discern and articulate truth. And that the relevant truth would itself prescribe not an imposed orthodoxy, but rather freedom, freedom especially in matters of thought, speech, and religion. And this last point, by the way, is relevant to um, a different important debate that I'll only allude to but a little later in this talk. Uh, in a condition of freedom, fallible human beings will disagree about the truth, but they can debate such questions in civil fashion, or so Murray contended. And civilly engaging your neighbor about fundamental matters on which you disagree is not an affront or an insult. On the contrary, it's a manifestation of respect for your neighbor's beliefs, cognitive capacities, and character. And this kind of civil engagement about truth is the basis of the American Republic. As Murray put it, civilization is formed by men locked together in argument. At the time his book appeared, there was nothing especially heterodox about Murray's position, I think. As we've seen already, his understanding of America was explicitly based on the Declaration of Independence. And his assertion that not only individuals, but nations should acknowledge the sovereignty of God was at the time not some radical or reactionary proposal, on the contrary, it was entirely faithful to the American political tradition. If we had the time and inclination, um, we could uh, support his view with plentiful statements from people who were presumptively sane, not fanatical or reactionary or marginal, people like George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, even FDR, and of course the man who was president when Murray's book was published, Dwight Eisenhower. But if Murray's interpretation was more or less orthodox at the time, it would shortly become more heretical or even offensive, as it probably still is today, at least in respectable academic circles. An almost opposite strategy was in process of being formulated and would eventually be perhaps best articulated by philosophers like John Rawls. The alternative view reflects a very different and less sanguine supportive philosophy. It holds that whether or not there are fundamental moral or political truths, human beings will never agree about them, and trying to reason about such disagreements, or at least trying to reason about them in public discourse, will be divisive and will be received as expressions of disrespect. It was disagreement over basic truths, after all, that gave us the wars of religion. And what we learned from such horrific experiences, or should have learned, is that government in a pluralistic community will work best not by trying to discern and state ultimate truths, but rather by distancing itself from such claims. Decisions about basic political matters should thus be made through deliberation that doesn't invoke anyone's comprehensive doctrines, as Rawls put it, especially religion. So these two alerted men, Murray and Rawls, can be taken as representatives of two opposite strategies for dealing with political pluralism. For Murray, political communities form by engagement with matters of basic truth, including religious truth. For Rawls, political communities sustained by avoiding public engagement with basic truth, especially religious truth. It'll be helpful to have labels for these opposing strategies. For convenience, let's call Murray's proposal the engagement with truth strategy, or for short, just the truth strategy. We might then be tempted to call the opposing position the avoidance of truth strategy, and I think that description would capture an important feature of the alternative strategy. But just by itself, it also sounds pejorative and merely negative. It doesn't convey the positive content of the alternative strategy. So we need to supplement it with a more positive term. Uh, what should it be? One candidate would be respect. The basic idea would be that in a pluralistic community, we should try to respect everyone and thus everyone's views. But for reasons I've already touched on, I think respect would be question begging. That's because the truth strategy also values respect, but it holds that even in the context of public discourse, you can respect a person, indeed you show more respect, by taking that person's basic convictions seriously and engaging with them than by ignoring or attempting to marginalize those convictions. So a better and still charitable description, I think, would adopt one of Rawls' favorite terms. It would say that the alternative strategy finds the basis of political community in reasonableness. Reasonableness, not in the epistemic sense of rationality exactly, or boldly following a reason of wherever it may lead, but rather in the civic or social sense of respectfully getting along without questioning or criticizing anyone's faith or basic beliefs. That's the sense of reasonableness, I think, that we often intuitively and tacitly adopt in polite social settings, uh, where we understand that it would be a breach of etiquette and divisive to bring up religion or some other topics as a subject of potential contention. 
As I've already said, when Murray's book was published, his ideas, including his idea that the sovereignty of God should be publicly acknowledged, resonated with the American political tradition. In the following decade, though, the Supreme Court turned away from Murray's position and from the traditional American position and decisively embraced the Rawlsian or avoidance of truth or reasonableness strategy. Or to be more chronologically accurate, we might say that the theories of Rawls and similarly minded thinkers can be viewed as elaborating and defending and in some ways extending the basic idea or intuition informing the avoidance of truth strategy that the court had already embraced in the 1960s. Thus, during the 1960s and 1970s, the Supreme Court would declare over and over again that the First Amendment's Establishment Clause demands that the government must not engage with claims of, of religious truth. Instead, government must be strictly neutral toward religion, neutral both among religions and between religion and what the justices sometimes described as non-religion. And government must satisfy this requirement of religious neutrality by confining itself to the domain of the secular. Secular not in the classical sense, meaning something of this world, so that you could have like the secular clergy, um, but rather in the conventional modern sense of not religious. <clears throat> this requirement that government must be secular or not religious applied to the purposes for which government can legitimately act, to the primary effects of government actions, and as the court eventually made explicit to the expressions or messages that government might deliberately or inadvertently send. These prohibitions were embodied in what came to be known as the lemon test and the no endorsement test. Now, to be fair, we should note that this requirement of a comprehensive governmental secularity and religious neutrality wasn't intended to be anti-religious in the way, say, that communist governments were anti-religious. On the contrary, as the free exercise jurisprudence that was developing at the same time uh, prescribed, religion was still to be respected and even legally protected in the private sphere, which, as the justices repeatedly insisted, is where religion belongs. Neither was the new regime anti-truth in any totalistic way. Claims and debates about comprehensive doctrines and religious propositions um, were still permitted to flourish and encouraged in the private domain. But the public sphere, or the governmental sphere, was to be secular and neutral. I want to pause here for just a moment to notice something puzzling or paradoxical about the new constitutional regime and how it came about. The justices themselves and most of the learned commentators in the country don't seem to have perceived anything especially audacious about the new doctrines. They seem to have thought that they were just making uh, explicit what had been implicit in the American Republic all along. And I think that has come to be the dominant view. Even more conservative uh, or religious justices and commentators, though they've often been sharply critical of particular decisions and even of general doctrines like the Lemon Test, uh, have largely acquiesced in or even enthusiastically embraced the basic premises of the new regime, namely that state and national governments in America should be neutral toward religion and should stay within the secular domain. And yet the requirement of governmental neutrality and secularity was in fact a radical departure, I would argue, from the American political tradition. And if these radical implications were mostly lost on the justices and the professoriate, they were perceived at the time by the American people generally the decisions uh, provoked a massive hostile public reaction, and by at least one justice. Thus, in the first school prayer decision, Justice William O. Douglas listed other things that might now be subject to invalidation under the new doctrine. Religious expressions in presidential addresses, Thanksgiving Day proclamations, the Pledge of Allegiance, the national anthem, the national motto, and God we trust, and maybe even Douglas implied official recognition of the Christmas holiday. And I think that people and Justice Douglas were right. Of course, the courts have never carried out the full-scale purge uh, that Justice Douglas imagined. The justices have spared many vestiges of the older providentialism by asserting basically that these traditional expressions have over time lost their religious meaning or significance. Uh, that's an assertion that's offensive to believers and non-believers alike. But still, despite the best efforts of people like Michael Newdow and the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the words, in God we trust, are still printed on every dollar bill. But officially, at least, the words don't mean what they seem to say. Officially, we don't as a nation any longer acknowledge the sovereignty of God. On that and other fundamental questions, individuals can have their individual views. And even politicians and officials speaking as individuals can have their views. But we as a nation are officially neutral. Murray's proposal and the American political tradition on the one hand, and on the other hand, the court's secular neutrality jurisprudence and its elaboration in the philosophy of reasonableness thus reflect two diametrically different approaches to the challenges of pluralism and political community. 
And the implications, I believe, are momentous. First, consider the uh, particular, but as, uh, as uh, Dean Cole mentioned just now, immensely weighty matter of religious freedom itself, which has often been described as our first freedom. In the traditional American understanding, religious freedom is to be, to be respected because there's a truth, a religious truth, if you like, and that truth entails that people are to be left free in matters of religion. Coercion in, in religion would be, as Jefferson put it, quote, a departure from the plan of the holy author of our religion. That's why we protect it. In the newer jurisprudence, that sort of theistic rationale is constitutionally out of bounds. So then why is religion deserving of special constitutional protection? Well, modern theorists stammer out, stammer out answers, but none of the answers seem at all compelling. And theorists may thus draw the conclusion that although religious freedom somehow managed to worm its way into the Constitution, there's really no very good rationale for such special treatment. Or insofar as religious freedom is still favored, this is likely on the complacent assumption that religion is a private matter, a sort of personal preference, one that some people still care a lot about, and that's mostly irrelevant to governance anyway, so absent some good reason to the contrary, government ought just to leave religion alone. But the new doctrines were not merely a reinterpretation of the First Amendment or of religious freedom. They amounted to a fundamentally different conception of what America is. And that newer conception has had consequences that go far beyond the specialized constitutional field of religious freedom. For example, in constitutional law, issues about marriage, human reproduction, and sexuality aren't usually thought of as religion clause issues. But those discussions are powerfully affected by the conception of government as strictly secular and religiously neutral. In this way, there was, I believe, a discernible line from the school prayer decisions where the new regime was announced to Roe versus Wade and Obergefell against Hodges. Which brings us to the obvious question, which of these opposed strategies is to be preferred and how would we go about answering that question? Well, most of us will be influenced in part by whether we like the consequences of the newer conception. So if you think Roe and Obergefell were just or enlightened decisions, that would be a reason to favor the secular neutrality or reasonableness approach and vice versa. But beyond their specific consequences, we also can think about the underlying philosophies that I've said these strategies reflect. Murray's strategy, once again, is more sanguine, and Rawls's is more reticent about the existence of fundamental truths, including the existence of an attentive God, about the ability of humans to debate and discern these truths, and about the importance of truths, not just for individuals, but as a necessary foundation for a political community, and in particular for our political community. So then which of these philosophies or these orientations toward truth seems more valid or persuasive with respect to our present situation? When the question's posed that way, I find myself vacillating, a bit like the university presidents, I'm afraid, that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. And I confess that I don't have as much confidence in our ability to discern basic truths through reason itself as some have, or as Murray seems to have had, or at least about our ability to articulate the most fundamental truths in human language. Uh, nonetheless, I favor Murray's truth strategy over the alternative. So why? Well, part of the reason is that I think that unless they're grounded in truth commitments, concepts like the idea that every human being has inherent dignity and equal moral worth come to seem like convenient but ultimately implausible fictions. I also think that in their application to practical questions, school prayer, teaching of evolution, religious reasons and political decision making, and all of the list of questions, the operative concepts in the reasonableness strategy, concepts like equality and neutrality become question begging and vacuous. I won't say much about that here. I'll just offer a summary allusion to a famous article by Peter Weston that some, you know, makes make some of these points. And I've spent a lot of pages, too many probably, writing about those questions in my scholarship. But in this talk, I want to emphasize an even more fundamental reason. Professor Garnett often likes to stress the importance of what he and others sometimes call moral anthropology. Everything turns, Professor Garnett suggests, on, quote, an account of what it means to be human, of what a person is. I think Professor Garnett is right. I mentioned before, he says I've influenced him, but I think I agree with him on everything that he's ever, just about everything <laughs> that I ever hear him say. Um, and I also think that Father Murray's truth strategy is more compatible with a sound moral anthropology with what human beings distinctively are than the court's secular neutrality or Professor Rawls's reasonableness. In support of this conviction, I'd invoke Thomas Aquinas's observation that, quote, truth must consequently be the end of the whole universe and the consideration of the wise man aims principally at truth. Of course, there's a lot more to say on this subject than could be said in a short talk, 
or them can be said even in a very long talk by me. Uh, but I think the claim basically is that what makes us persons and gives us a distinctive dignity is not our physical speed and dexterity, not our ability to satisfy our physical wants more effectively than other animals do, not our capacity to build skyscrapers and rockets and communication systems, not even our inclination to form ourselves into complex societies. Rather, it's our orientation to truth, our commitment to finding truth, our admittedly limited or impaired capacity to discern truth, and our inclination to live in accordance with the truth that we find or that we think we find. On this view, Murray's truth-oriented strategy attempts to found human community on our essence or on the feature that makes us distinctively human. It will be as full human beings that we come together in community. By contrast, the reasonableness strategy asks us basically to suspend or bracket or suppress uh, this essential human quality for public purposes in the interest of getting along or not offending others. It's only as partial persons, as shadows of our real selves, that we come together in political community. Michael Zuckert, who recently retired from the government department here, expressed the point by imagining a comment of Calvin on the modern strategy. For shame, Professor Rawls, Zuckert imagines, is a bit of threat to your comfort and safety all it takes to scare you off your convictions? Do you men of Harvard know nothing of truth? Martin Luther said, here I stand, I can do no other. He knew the princes of church and state would give him no peace, no rest, yet he stood. And you Harvard philosophers, what do you say? Here I sit, I dare do no more. <laughs> um, is, this, uh, so is this characterization unfair? Uh, well, I suppose a proponent of reasonableness might respond that no one is asking anyone to sacrifice their commitment to truth, but only to act on that commitment mostly within the private sphere, not to bring it too overtly into the public domain where it's likely to pro provoke contention and offense. But I'd offer quickly two observations. First, to indulge in a gross understatement, the public domain constitutes a not insignificant part of our lives. To ask us to be less than our full human selves in the public domain is no small demand. And second, quarantining our truth orientation to the private domain is likely to enfeeble that orientation even in that domain. That's because truth is truth. Uh, it makes no sense, or it makes a hash of the very concept of truth, to treat a proposition as true only in the private domain. To treat something as a merely private truth is to imply that it's not really truth at all. And thus the exclusion of truth from the public domain reflects a devaluation of truth in general. I think, by the way, that this is a major reason why, as Yates foresaw, the center cannot hold. Almost a quarter century ago, in an essay defending the Rawlsian position, Notre Dame philosopher Philip Quinn, with whom I had the privilege of working on a couple of university committees, and uh, uh, who I found quite intimidating for, for his intelligence, but nonetheless, you know, a very engaging person, um, he acknowledged, uh, he was defending the Rawlsian position, and he acknowledged that a Rawlsian society would be uncongenial to people who, as he put it, quote, as a matter of conviction, want to live in ways tightly integrated around their comprehensive doctrines. He thought this class might include many religious people and also million liberals and Marxist socialists. Writing long before the term acquired its current associations, Quinn called such people integralists. And he considered, <laughs> he considered that, uh, he conceded that Rawlsian type liberalism, quote, does impose special burdens on the integralists and that it might even, quote, doom integralist forms of life to extinction. This was cause for regret, he thought, but alas, there is no social world without loss. I think Professor Quinn's observations were cogent as far as they went, but they failed to acknowledge the depth of the problem. The desire to live in accordance with what we believe to be true isn't just a preference that a few um, exotic groups happen to have. Um, it's uh, what makes us human and gives us, all of us, a distinctive dignity. So if we trade our orientation to truth in exchange for the hope of getting along amicably, which is basically the trade that the Supreme Court's neutrality jurisprudence ordained and that Rawlsian liberalism proposes, we're sacrificing our humanity in exchange for a shallow dehumanizing peace. So it isn't just a few exotic integralist forms of life, as Quinn put it, that would be burdened and may be doomed to extinction. It's life that respects what gives humans generally our distinctive dignity. So it should hardly be surprising if more and more people rise up in rebellion against this ill-conceived bargain, sometimes even embracing the label of integralism. Nor should it be especially surprising if people flock to a political leader whom they perceive as having the courage to proclaim unpopular truths, even if on closer inspection that leader seems to have very little regard for actual truth. 
I, I wasn't sure whether to include that line or not, but there's been, <laughs> you, you, could have, uh, you could take that in different ways, I hope. Uh, the irony is that as a society, we haven't even gotten the benefit of our dubious bargain. On the contrary, far from attaining civil peace and mutual respect, we now live in a society that is as fractured and contentious as it has been in decades and arguably in its entire history. And this condition reflects, I think, not just a failure of the reasonableness strategy, it is, I would argue, ironically, a product of the reasonableness strategy. How so? Well, in the first place, if we teach ourselves to see and engage our fellow citizens apart from what makes them essentially human and makes them the humans they are, it's not surprising that we will have less reason to see and treat them with respect. But on a more um, practical level, even in a society that attempts to embrace reasonableness rather than truth, as its basic community constituting commitment, people are still going to disagree about many things, and they're still going to need to engage in arguments explaining why their own cause is meritorious and their opponents is not. So then, what will you appeal to in forming your arguments? The natural course is for you to appeal to your comprehensive doctrines for what you believe to be true and fundamental. That's what the Declaration of Independence did and what Father Murray favored. If those sorts of doctrines have been ruled out of bounds, there will be fewer rhetorical resources available to you. But at least one thing will still be available. If the founding norm is, uh, is reasonableness, meaning mutual respect and civility, then the obvious and powerful rhetorical strategy will be to convict your opponents of violating that norm, of being disrespectful or uncivil, hateful or bigoted. Paradoxically and ironically, adopting mutual respect as the grounding norm virtually ensures that people will not be mutually respectful. They will be almost compelled to resort to accusing others who disagree with them, not so much of being mistaken with regard to the facts or the truth, but rather of being uncivil and hateful. And so we see today a public discourse, one that's rampant in politics, but also in the academy, and that even reaches the Supreme Court, of people trying to carry their cases by implicitly or openly accusing their opponents of being hateful, racist, sexist, or bigoted. And if the targets of these accusations protest that they don't hate anyone, and if these protestations seem to be at least sincere, the hatefulness can now be ascribed to their subconscious or to the social structures within which they live. More generally, we now live in a society, even in a civilization in which truth, or at least ultimate truths, have been systematically marginalized or devalued. Joseph Ratzinger observed that, quote, the really critical issue of the modern age is that the concept of truth has been virtually given up. Which brings us back to the woebegone university presidents and to the condition of the best lacking all conviction, while the worst are full of passion and intensity, and to the loss of a center that can hold. Because if central ideas and commitments can't claim to be grounded in ultimate truths, what is going to hold them in place? At this point in a talk, it's customary for the speaker to address the obvious uh, practical question, what is to be done? And the obvious answer might seem to be, we should renounce the jurisprudence of secular neutrality and the reasonableness strategy, and thereby free ourselves to once again ground our community on, as Marie said, truths and ongoing debates about the fundamental truths. And indeed, the Supreme Court does in recent years seem to be moving away from some of the older jurisprudence, although the ideal of neutrality seems to remain very much in place and popular among both conservatives and liberals. Critics find the court's recent First Amendment jurisprudence alarming. As you might imagine, I find it insufficient, but overall generally encouraging. And yet, I have to admit that I'm not sanguine about our prospects. Observations and recent studies seem to show that Americans generally are no longer oriented to matters of truth. This condition is evident in the pervasive fake news and the flagrant disregard for actual facts, so often detectable in contemporary journalism and politics, and it's evident in other ways. A study several years ago found that almost three quarters of American millennials agreed with the statement, quote, whatever is right for your life or works best for you is the only truth you can know. It's as if the reasonableness strategy in its determination to filter truth out of our public deliberations has infected our whole culture, perhaps even in some instances, our churches. The framers of the Declaration of Independence founded the new nation on a statement of truths. We hold these truths. Father Murray favored a similar strategy. But what truths do we hold today? Are there any such truths? Truths, that is, that we hold as a people. In these circumstances, I have to admit that I can't see how any academic book or article or any legislation or any electoral victory or any Supreme Court decision can get us onto a more promising path. At this point, though, I should probably confess that 
in one respect, my diagnosis of our situation might have gotten things backwards. It might be that the loss of belief in truth has been not so much a product of the jurisprudence of neutrality and the reasonableness avoidance of truth strategy as a cause. Father Murray could advocate that the nation be founded on truths, including the primary truth of the sovereignty of God, because he believed in truths, including the truth of God. Conversely, although as a Princeton undergraduate, John Rawls had written a precocious senior thesis that exhibited a sort of Calvinistic faith. In a later autobiographical essay, Rawls related how he lost his faith um, during his service in World War II. So in advocating that religious doctrines be removed from public discourse, Rawls was proposing a position for the nation that he had long ago already adopted for himself. And the fact that the nation's leaders, including justices and academic elites, tended to gravitate to Rawls's strategy rather than to Murray's may suggest that these elites were already closer in their own beliefs, or lack thereof, to Rawls than to Murray. But to the extent that the causal change runs from loss of belief to a jurisprudence of secular neutrality, not the other way around, it becomes even less likely that changing constitutional jurisprudence will be a solution to our problems. But then again, I'm almost finished here. If the primary truth is, as Murray thought, the sovereignty of God over nations as well as individuals, maybe there is a glimmer of hope after all. Maybe there is nothing that we can do just on our own to repair our situation. Maybe that intervention would need to come from outside, from a more transcendent source. In the Constitutional Convention, Benjamin Franklin quoted the biblical admonition. We have been assured, sir, Franklin said, in the sacred writings, that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. We shall be divided by our little partial local interests. Our projects will be confounded, and we ourselves shall become a reproach and byword down to future ages. I believe that what Franklin said was true then, prophetic even, and I believe that nothing has happened in the intervening decades to make his prophecy any less true now. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Steve. We have some time for some questions. You might have heard uh, Steve a few minutes ago say, kind of in passing, I'm not very sanguine about our prospects. And I sort of feel like that's a motto, like a credo. I've got dibs on it for the coffee cup industry. <laughs> very sanguine about our prospects. But um, uh, any questions for uh, our students? Go ahead. Back there. Thank you for your talk. Um, my question. Uh, Refers to your reference to uh, uh, Professor Michael Booker. Um, Thirty or so years ago, he made an argument about the Declaration, in which he argued that the self-evident truths in question were not truly self-evident in themselves. In other words, not true, but held as though they were self-evident. So not epistemologically self-evident. Uh, uh, in other words, self-evident in themselves but held as though they were by Americans. Mm -hmm. um, what is your response to that sort of uh, interpretation? In particular, the notion that it's not something that we believe in doesn't need a foundation of truth, but solely needs to be held as though it were true. Well, um, yeah, very interesting question. I might say, first of all, by the way, that um, Michael Zucker, when I mentioned the uh, terrorist friendships that I had formed here in Notre Dame, one was with Michael. One is with Michael Zucker. I think we had a book group that actually John Garvey organized. I think initially, and we meet sometimes at John's house, sometimes at, at my house. And uh, Michael Zucker was you know, one of the most active participants. So I had lots of discussions with him. He was a Straussian, as you, as you probably know. And um, so you know, he had interpretations of the Declaration of Independence and Locke and Jefferson and so forth that were distinctive and. You know, <laughs> Many of which I, uh, many of which I uh, wasn't entirely persuaded of, uh, by, I should say. And I do remember one time having lunch with him. We were talking about someone, I can't remember what, and then I said, he said, well, you said something. And I said, well, how likely is it that somebody would just say something in public when they didn't really even mean it? And I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, whether he was right about that, but, I mean, whether, um, whether it's accurate to say, and what it even means to say, that the propositions in the Declaration of Independence were self-evident truths, 
is a very debatable point. I, I definitely agree with that. I think, that's a question, what would Father Murray think about it? I think if you said that's a very debatable point, and even the term self-evident, I, as I recall, he, that probably wouldn't have been his preferred term and so forth, you know, for, for some of these things, but, um, but whether we can debate whether those things are true or not is uh, something I think he would welcome. What I suspect he would not welcome um, is to say, it doesn't really matter whether they're ultimately tr true or not. What matters is whether it's something that Americans generally believe. When you go there, which I think is sort of what Professor Rawls did too, you know, um, when he moved from a theory of justice to later political liberalism, uh, you're already on, the, I think you've already largely abandoned the, the sort of truth problem. I don't have the impression that, however, the Professor Zucker would favor or advocate that in general. He might think that was an interpretation, of, you know, of the Declaration of Independence and so forth. But I don't think he would, I think he was a person who cared about truth and believed in truth. He might think that political philosophers don't always express explicitly, you know, what they think the truth would be, that the truth is more esoteric. But I, I don't think he was in favor of that kind of, you know, some kind of interpretive conventionalism or something like that. So, uh, thanks. Um, thank you for your talk. One of the uh, jurisprudential moves that Murray was most concerned about in the decades leading up to the publication of We Hold These Truths was the incorporation of the Establishment Clause against the states. Um, I'm wondering now, thinking about, I mean, I think the historical evidence about the Establishment Clause is a possibility of incorporation is pretty persuasive. Do you think, do you think you'd follow Murray in saying maybe now that um, the possibility of reversing incorporation of the Establishment Clause might help us get back into debating these truths in local communities? Oh, well. Has anyone written about that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, it's kind of, I mean, I have an article for a symposium that both Professor Dunn and I are supposed to contribute to. I have a draft of one now that's kind of very much on exactly that, uh, on exactly that subject, and other people have written about it. Um, but, you know, just to say a few things. You know, whether the enactors of the 14th Amendment, um, whether you regard that as the members of Congress or the framers or the public generally, you know, or, you know, whoever you regard as the, you know, the obviously differences in theories of original meaning and so forth, you know, who you should be looking to. Whoever you look to, whether, whether they intended to incorporate the Establishment Clause against the states is, I think, just as a historical matter, very debatable. Um, I mean, there are little sort of variations on that, but, but it's just a very debatable point. And so someone says, I think as a historical matter, I don't think that incorporation is a correct historical interpretation. That's, I, I'm not saying I necessarily do or don't agree with that, but it's certainly a very plausible position. Whether there's any likelihood, though, that that's going to change in the jurisprudence in the near future seems to me quite unlikely. Um, and, and whether it would be a good thing is another question, but what I think... I do tend to favor as a good thing would be whether it's through disincorporation, which seems to me unlikely to happen, maybe a bit of a non-starter as a practical matter, or whether it's through more deferential interpretations that leave more room for states. Uh, I should say uh, Justice um, um, Harlan at the time advocated a sort of an a sort of a two-level incorporation where you incorporate sort of some of the Bill of Rights against the states, but not treat them as having exactly the same meaning or the same constraints against states as against the national government, which would have left more room for states to, you know, deviate and, and vary. And so uh, at our present moment, I tend to think that that's, uh, well, predicting the future is very hard. You know, one view on that is if we do that, it's just going to lead us further down the road to fragmentation, balkanization. States are going to do different things. But the other interpretation is it will leave more room for debate, as you said, at the local uh, state and local levels and so forth about what things they mean, to, to come up with within some limits, um, variations so that people will have more opportunity as they did in the first century or so of our the Republic to find communities that are congenial to them. So I'm cautiously in favor of so something like that. I hope that's a little bit responsive to your question. Uh, Professor Garnett. Thanks, Steve, for being here. Uh, you, uh, you say that you know the court's jurisprudence is still like pretty much rooted in the neutrality principle, and so it's not really fully embracing truth. But to, to uh, Dennis's question, 
I mean, the new rule in Kennedy, which says we're not doing this lemon stuff anymore, we stopped doing it a long time ago. We, we forgot to tell anybody, but we, <laughs> we're not doing that anymore. And now yeah. we're going to do this sort of history and tradition. Um, and I'm thinking about in the context of public schools, for yeah. example. I mean, does that give more space for the kinds of truth um, exploration that you really believe what the court says, yeah. that history and tradition is now the benchmark for the establishment clauses? Is that not just a corporation, but it's certainly giving um, more space for that kind of thing? Yeah, I think that's right. I think, say, it's history and tradition, it's pretty amorphous. Our history and tradition are very complex and subject, as we know, to lots of different interpretations. So that's a possible, well, not just possible, it's an actual criticism that people make of that approach, of course. Um, and it does have some bite to it, but you might think that's a good thing. You know, that's a feature, not a bug, because it's going to lead more, you know, for variations and so on. Um, so, yeah, I do tend to agree with that. Where I, where you and I might have a little different, but this will tie back more into the former question, is if you look at the, you know, these school aid cases recently, like Casey and uh, Espinoza and that, I would say that these are cases that aggressively apply the neutrality principle to limit states' ability to uh, you know, run their schools as they want to. They've done it in ways that I am totally in favor of. I've, I've always liked the outcomes on their own, but, but they don't leave much room for states to you know, have different variations and so forth like that. So, so there's a bit of a trade-off there, I think, from if you wanted to call it a, even sort of a conservative perspective. You know, do you want to have what you and I might agree is the preferable situation imposed or do you want to leave more room for states to go different ways, knowing that some of them are going to go ways that you and I probably, you know, and others won't agree with? At the moment, I'm a little bit inclined to, at this moment in our history, it might be a valuable thing to give states and so forth a little more, a little more leeway to develop their ideas the way they want to. Walter White here, you might want to tread lightly on this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, that, that's a position that a lot of people... I have a way of saving, by the way, in my article, saving Casey and these decisions. You know, say that they still reach the right results. But you know, I mean, so. Wonderful to have you back. Uh, so. uh, my only uh, uh, criticism of the lecture is I wish there was a lecture two, a second part. Uh, in the second part, I would ask this question or maybe have you meditate or talk about this. If I understood the conclusion, the, the quote from Franklin, uh, it was... Um, uh, meditation on perhaps the necessity of religious truth to ground a regime dedicated to truth. Not sure if that's exactly right, but that's what I took from it. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if that is a correct understanding of uh, your concluding point, what is the role of reason, natural reason, not reasonableness, but just reason, philosophical mm -hmm. reason, in adjudicating between claim, competing claims of religious truth? Well, as you as you very well know. You know, that's a topic that's been debated for centuries within the Christian tradition, right? Faith, you know, to, to what extent does reason by, um, have lots of different learned answers to that from people like Aquinas and then Protestants have tended to, you know, favor a, a little less confidence in reason itself as being able to do things. Uh, I might not draw the lines in exactly the same way everybody else does, but Aquinas is, I think, overall position seems to me to be uh, quite sound, which is there are some truths we can know through reason, and there are others that we need revelation for. And so, you know, and, and you can't really show, well, what would his examples be? You know, I think he would say, you can't necessarily show the full truth of the Trinity through reason alone, or, you know, different, different things of that sort, but you can know certain things through reason. Something like that, you know, as a general matter, would be of what I would incline to as, a, as an answer to that. But it's obviously a huge question that the, I was just last week reading um, a book about Anselm, who um, gravitated very much to the reason side of things, right? You know, you can know a whole lot through reason, so forth. Um, the, the motto that you just mentioned, I'm not so sanguine. <laughs> kept arising as, as I was reading that, impressive though his demonstrations were, and so on, so, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your lecture. I uh, My question relates to Professor Garnett's uh, question. You talked a lot about uh, your concerns about the jurisprudence of secular neutrality, and I, I certainly share those concerns. Um, but I wonder if there might be some wisdom in what, uh, what you might call a jurisprudence of 
non-secular neutrality, theistic neutrality, or even neutrality among Christian denominations, which might be a bit closer to the original meaning of the establishment clause. Um, in other words, mm -hmm. uh, where the where there are distinctions made at least between religion and non-religion, yeah, um, uh, or you know, theistic views and and other other things that people might claim to be religions but are not theistic, yeah, uh, but. Uh, but that we're not trying to be neutral, neutral in the secular sense, right? Yes. Uh, well, that's a inviting thing to consider. It's, it gets to be pretty difficult. To, so, in the nineteenth century, as you probably know, um, you know, the prevailing view was non-sectarianism. You know, and in education, non-sectarian education, uh, it should be neutral among religions. Something more like what you're saying. There's nothing wrong with teaching religion, but it should be non-sectarian religion. You know, critics. And Catholics at the time, I think, well understood <laughs> that non-sectarian was Protestant. It was kind of like a generic <laughs> Protestant thing. And I think that'll always be true. So uh, if you went a little bit farther back to um, the founding, I think you can see that people like uh, George Washington um, had no hesitation about invoking God in, their, you know, in his first inaugural, says it would be really wrong not to you know, thank uh, Providence for the situation we're in. But he also seemed to make every effort to use, let's say, terms that were as non-sectarian as possible. Right? You know, and I think, um, I think responsible, wise statespersons would presumably sort of always try to do that in a civic situation, you know, to, you know, why gratuitously you know, divide and insult people and so forth by using terms that are more sectarian than are necessary. So, uh, but whether that could be built into a viable constitutional jurisprudence, I think, is a little harder question as the 19th century situation points out. You know, um, uh, one of the people who's written the most, maybe the most uh, legal scholars about the education situation in the 19th century, uh, 19th century is Stephen Green, you know, has a, one book and a lot of other things about that. Uh, and I, um, I first met him, by the way, when he invited me to respond to a comment he was making at a conference in Colorado Springs. So he elaborated at great length on how, um, in the 19th century, uh, they said that education was non-sectarian, and how this was uh, clearly Protestant, not you know, not Catholic, not Jewish, not and so forth. You know, and the lesson is that we need to be strictly neutral in general. Because uh, when we think we're being non-sectarian, we're really not. And so we should just be neutral. And I thought, and he doesn't seem to say, didn't, somehow didn't seem to perceive that what, what you're saying is totally against the views of many other people today and so forth. You know, it just sort of shows that when you use neutrality, I think as the, I think neutrality, it is kind of like a ideal of sorts in certain contexts where you, right, but it's not very viable as you know, an enforceable principle. I guess that, that's what I tend to tend to think about. That, so, would you all please join me in thanking? <laughs>